Well, today we're going to start or actually uh, end our series uh, on core values. And we're going to talk today about as a people and as a church being culturally relevant in our world. And, and that may not sound real exciting, but it's going to be very personal as we move through this. And I think this is a challenge that we all need. I mean, sometimes I preach messages that are real easy because I feel like God's really kind of worked something in me. This is one he's still working in me. So it's tougher to preach. But uh, I need it. We all need it. So when Jesus came to the earth, he came on mission. Jesus had a double focus, two missions when he came to earth. Number one, reveal God as a father. Because people did not understand who God was. They saw God as, as a king, a tyrant maybe, someone who required a sacrifice, who was judgmental, who was hard to please, who was aloof and distant. And Jesus came to reveal, no, God is not like that. He said, if you've seen me, the compassion and the love that I have, you've seen the Father. This is a Father that loves his kids that are estranged from him, and he wants to draw them back in. And that's why Jesus primarily came, because if we couldn't have that kind of picture of God, why would we be drawn to him? And all the people had was the law at that time, and Jesus came to say, relationship replaces law. Then, the other reason he came is to destroy the works of the enemy. 1 John 3, 8 said, Jesus came for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. What were those works? When man sinned, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, when they sinned and lost dominion of this world and that was handed over to the enemy, man had lived under the power of Satan's authority. He became the authority of this world, and because of sin and failure, man was always under bondage. And that fear of death reigned. And Jesus, through one sacrifice of his own life on the cross, redeems mankind dies for all of our sins, and now he offers the world this gift of life. So this is why Jesus came. Reveal God as a father and destroy the works of the enemy. He also gave us a mission, and that mission is in two parts, and it's very simple. When Jesus came, when two people, different people came to Jesus, they said, what is it about? What is this kingdom life all about? And Jesus answered them both the same way. Number one, Love the Lord God with all your heart. And number two, love people as yourself. Love God, love people. That mission has never changed in 2,000 years. We have the same co-mission with Christ, because it's a co-mission because he's doing it with us. We're commissioned or commissioned to work with Jesus in bringing his love to a broken world. The challenge is, the world is changing, isn't it? And some see the church and its message as irrelevant and out of touch. And the one thing that I, I want to talk to us about today is how that message is relevant for a world that seems far from God, a post-Christian world where everybody doesn't grow up in church. How does that message become culturally relevant in a world that's changing. And times are changing, aren't they? I mean, crazy rate of change in our country, in our world. And churches, organizations, even businesses have to learn to adapt and change with it. Can you imagine a business that, you know, today in this day and age, they said, you know, we don't need that internet thing. You know, all that free delivery and social media and stuff like that, oh, we don't need none of that. And all they hear is crickets, you know, because they're out of business. <clears throat> if businesses cannot adapt, they go the way of the dinosaur. Look at some of these brands. Remember these? What happened? These were all big companies that hired thousands and thousands of people, leaders in their industry, and yet they're all gone or just a shell of what they were at one point. I saw where Sears has sold off Kenmore, they've sold off uh, Die Hard, they've sold off all craftsmen, all these names that they had built over the years. 
these brands that they had under them, they're all gone. There's nothing left. Why? Why does one company make it? Why do you go to a mall and you go up to like Fashion Mall in Keystone? And it'll be relatively empty until you get around the corner where the Apple store is, and it's packed. Why is that? Because Stephen Jobs, years ago, had a picture of what the future could be. He saw what the, what the future could be. He saw that we could do everything on this handheld device, and it changed the world. He was a leader in that area. He was a visionary. Um, Steven Spielberg, for example. The movie Avatar. He wanted to do that movie for years and couldn't do it because the technology to do it wasn't invented yet. So he had to wait until computers caught up with the ability to fulfill his vision. Peter Drucker, who's the father of modern management, said this. He said, a successful entrepreneur is one who identifies that future that has already happened. To be aware of what's going on in our world to such a, a way that we lead instead of just waiting to see what happened. Wayne Gretzky, considered the hockey player, best hockey player of all time, said this. He says, I'm successful because I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. It's that anticipation. It's that ability to see into the future, to know what is going on, and how to respond. Now, we are a people that say we are led by the Spirit of God, and I would think the Holy Spirit knows what's happening in the world. And I would think that he has the ability to help us to adapt and reach the world around us. But I don't think it's his problem. I think it's me. I think he struggles with me and listening and being willing to adapt and change and go out of my way to love people that maybe are difficult to love. I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to lead me and lead us into a future a lot more than we're willing to go because we like our traditions and we like life the way it is. But like I said, it's changing and we've got to change with it. This is our statement. And we share this with 2,500 vineyard churches around the world about this. The church exists for the sake of those who are exiled from God. We are called to bring the gospel of the kingdom in every nook and cranny of creation, faithfully translating the message of Jesus in language and forms that are relevant to a diverse people and cultures. We're the church that exists for the disillusioned, the curious, the skeptical, to those anywhere on their faith journey. And this city is full of those kind of people. And they're desperately in need of an encounter with God that flows out of Christians that are full of God's heart and mercy and compassion. And he's calling us to be those people. We often talk about our mission as being an outwardly focused church. And I think for a lot of us, we like what the church does and its programs and so on. But that will never reach our community. Church programs will never do it. We have to inculcate this down into our being. It's got to be a core value. It's got to be something that emanates from our life, that we're convinced this is the way God's called us to live. The church's history in adapting and changing isn't really good, is it? We tend to not catch on right away. I was thinking about the great missions movements of the past in the 1700s and 1800s. And what happened is churches sent out missionaries all over the world. But then these missionaries, maybe they got to Africa and they went, oh, this won't do. Look at how these people are dressed. We got to get some clothes on these folks. And these cultures they have, they don't even speak English. How can they read the Bible if they don't speak English? We got to teach them to read hymnals, to dress appropriately, even though it's out in the middle of a jungle. We want them to dress in long clothes because we consider that appropriate. And so what basically they tried to do was colonialize the people and make them good Europeans 
good Westerners before they made them Christians. Because they saw that as all tied together, and it's not. The kingdom of God is full of expressions of all kinds of people. And we need that blending of every type of person, every form of worship, every type of expression of God's kingdom to look like the people are going to be around the throne of God because Revelation 7-9 says God has people currently that have gone before us and heaven will be filled with people from every tribe and every nation and every language. Now, one of the wonderful things that's happening and a lot of people don't see it as wonderful, especially old white guys like me. The world is a different place, and it's changing, and they're coming to us. Michael Palandro, who pastors uh, our Vineyard Church down in Houston, said this. He said, we are not a melting pot, but we're a stew pot. In this new reality, we still stand together as Americans in one society, but we retain much more of our ethnic and cultural distinctives. People are coming to this country from Spanish-speaking countries. They don't want to learn English. We go, well, but, but we set the rules. Well, the world's changing. Rice University sociologist Stephen Kleinberg said this. From 1492, when the first immigrants came to America, until 1960, 85% of all immigrants coming to America were from Europe. But starting in the 1990s, 88% of immigrants to America are coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. Now, I grew up in St. Louis. St. Louis is a very diverse community. It had its ethnic neighborhoods when I was growing up. I lived real close to the hill. Is anybody familiar with the hill in St. Louis? If you want good Italian food, that's where you go, because that's the Italian neighborhood. Italian grocery stores, Italian bakeries, Italian delis. It's awesome. You don't eat good Italian food in St. Louis unless you're on the hill. And then there was a German neighborhood, and then a Dutch neighborhood. And even though they were different, they all had something in common. They were all white European immigrants. And even though everybody was different, we still looked a lot alike. And that's the way it's been in America, again, since 1492. But in 1990s, and that's recent in history, that's like a breath ago, everything started changing. Until a few years from now, white people will be a minority in the U.S. Like I said, if you're white, you go, gulp. We liked our winning streak. We liked being in charge. We don't want to go back. But that's the plan. As people of the kingdom, we can't be identified. Hear this. As people of God's kingdom, we cannot be identified with those who primarily are concerned with preserving an America that was. But instead, we want to be identified with God's agenda to love and reach America that is and will be. That is patriotism. It's when you can love and value people that are different and allow them to excel and maybe have to take a second chair. But see, that shouldn't affect us. This is something that as people of the kingdom we should embrace because we are called, the very essence of the gospel is reconciliation. It's about connecting people with God. Paul said that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Our role in life is to connect people to God. And being the dominant community or the dominant ethnicity in an area means that we should be the most open and the most giving. And we should be the people that invite people in to experience what we've got to experience and honor them and give them special honor because they haven't had the privilege that we've had. That's just truth. And again, for so many people, that's hard to, to accept. 
We actively work to break down barriers of culture and gender and social class and ethnicity. That should be part of our mission. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at Ephesians here for a little bit today. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses really 14 through 22, we're going to kind of camp out there. The Apostle Paul says this, I'm, I'm reading from the Passion Translation as well. And if you have a U version on your phone or tablet, you can open it up. Look for events on the left-hand side. You can follow along there or on the screen. Our reconciling peace is Jesus. He has made Jews and non-Jew one in Christ. Now, if you're Jewish, and this is Paul's audience he's writing to, the world was broken into two groups. Jews and people that should be Jews, that want to be Jews. I wish they were Jews. And, and Paul says he's taken everybody. When he makes that statement, he's including everyone. And we are one in Christ. By dying as our sacrifice, he has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us and has now made us equal through union with Christ. Everybody that you see on the street, God loves just as much as you. And he wants to bless them as much as he wants to bless you. And they're deserving of his blessing as much as you are. <coughs> I, I had this picture this week when I was thinking about this verse and kind of meditating on it. I pictured myself walking down the street and seeing someone who is maybe homeless or begging, and I passed them by. And, and uh, it wasn't that God prompted me to stop or anything, but I just pictured myself kind of going by them on my way to do something. And then later the thought came, Tony, that was a friend of yours. Someone tells me, you know, that was a friend of yours or that was a relative of yours. And I went, oh, no. How did I, how did I not treat them with dignity? Why did I try to meet their need? And as I was having that picture, it was like the Lord said, and Tony, they are your brother and sister. And even though you don't know them, I know them. And I love them. So just be sensitive when I prompt you to do something. It doesn't mean I have to help every person I see. I walk in obedience to God. But I want to open my heart to more obedience. I don't want, you know, visions have to be painted in the heavens for me to stop and love someone. I want that gentle voice, that little prompting of the Holy Spirit to move me to action. Verse 15, ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of his precious body on the cross. The legal code that stood condemning every one of us has now been repealed by his command. His triune essence has made peace between us by starting over, forming one new race of humanity, Jews and non-Jews fused together. I want to stop here for a minute and, and talk about something. When he talks about one human race, you know, one of the things that happened in our country in the 1800s was when Darwin, Charles Darwin, did his studies, and, and he was accurate on some things. We do believe in evolution within a species. Dogs look different than dogs that they came from. But we don't believe that dogs evolved into a horse or, or into a cat or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we don't believe that, that evolution leaped species. There's just no proof for that. But not only did Darwin come out with his theory of evolution, he also had another theory that became very popular. And what he did was he was the first person to define people by race. And he talked about three great races in the world and which ones were better than the others. And it was Darwin that brought his scientific theory to back racism and prejudice in our country. Now people had science to prove it, that certain people were inferior to others. And this was used for a long time to create and justify segregation in our country. We are one human race. We have many different ethnicities. But at our core, we all have the same DNA. We are the same people. 
And that's important for us to understand and embrace. When we talk about racial differences, these are not racial differences. Like we're somehow from different planets or we're different people. Many times it doesn't even have to do with ethnicity. It has to do with particulars and areas and conflicts that have been going on and so on. My point in saying this is that God's truth is that we are one people. And if we would just embrace that idea, we would stop judging people and putting such a big emphasis on ethnicity. Because ethnicity to me is not near as important as race. I have a lot more in common with you if we're both human beings than I do if we're different races. Because that means like it sounds like we're completely different. And we need to diminish that language because that is not language of the kingdom of God. Like it says here, God is forming one new race of people. He's restoring this. What is God's goal? Verse 22, I want to jump to the end here. God is transforming each one of you into a holy of holies. His dwelling place through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. We cannot be the kind of church that holds on to, or as a people individually, holding on to traditional views and forms and traditions of men. Jesus spoke against these things. He has called us to go out and live our life in a world in such a way that we actually engage people and we go out of our way to engage people that are different than us. And rather than look down on people, we, we, we look up at them. We see the potential of God inside their life. We see what God can do to change them and transform them and to build them into something great. I look at some of you and I know where God has brought you from and what he's done in your life and what he's doing in your life. And it took somebody loving me for my life to be changed. Some people had to reach pretty far down to love me. And I'm grateful that they did. To reach people in this world. I used to, this is kind of outdated, but I used to hear this. I thought this was a great expression. It says we're going to have to reach people. We're going to have to sit in the smoking section. <laughs> you don't have many of those anymore. <laughs> but we are going to have to get a little messy. We have to smell like some smoke. Now, what the church has traditionally done is instead of rushing into our world to reach people, we just hang our shingle out and say, come to us and clean up your act. And when you become enough like us, we'll start to embrace you. Otherwise, you really scare us. And you can justify it. I mean, you know, the Apostle John said, come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins, so you'll not receive any of her plagues. Peter said, escape the corruption of this generation. Paul said, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What, you know, right, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light and darkness have? So what is God telling us? Go reach the world or be isolated from it? Or do we be monastic and, and live like the Amish? I don't think it could give up television and movies, and, 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 you know, cars, and stuff like that. I like those things. I don't think I could live on a farm. <laughs> I grew up in the city. I just, I wouldn't do well on a farm. I don't think God's calling us to some restricted lifestyle. I also don't think he's called us to hibernate, and, and kind of protect our kids, and and try to guard them from all the influences of the world. I think the way we stand against the outside pressure is to build within them this core of beliefs like we're talking about. To have these values inside that they are loved by God. And that he has worked in them. And he has this incredible destiny on their life. And the only way they're going to fulfill what they were made for is to be in relationship with him and follow him. And if we raise our kids that way, we're not just abandoning them to the world. We're unleashing them on the world. We're not just raising kids. We are making disciples that are equipped and ready to tackle anything out there because the grace of God and the character of God has been worked in their lives. That's the goal. Jesus walked in the radical middle. He loved God and loved people. 
He walked with sinners without compromising. He loved sinners without engaging in sin. He engaged culture while still challenging it. It is a life lived in tension, and that tension is good. Take it away, take away that tension, and you have ineffective Christianity. You have something that's wrapped in fear and isolationism. And unfortunately, that's what too many people and too many churches have done. Paul said, I've become all things to all men that I might reach some. That was his goal. To love people, like I said, is going to require sacrifice and risk and vulnerability. But this is what Jesus did and what he's called us to. In a changing world, we're going to have to open our lives and be vulnerable. C.S. Lewis, I love this quote from The Four Loves. He wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it up carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe and dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. Because to love is to be vulnerable. In the 1800s, when all the missionaries were trying to convert the people to their nationalistic views, make them good Westerners, one guy did something different. A guy by the name of Hudson Taylor went to um, China to reach Chinese people. Now, what's special about that is he went to China at a time when Britain was in war with China. He'd be like an American missionary during World War II going, I'm going to go to Germany and reach Germans. People go, I ain't supporting you. And he got a lot of resistance. The missionaries that were there began to reject Hudson Taylor because, look at this, he grew his beard out, he grew his hair long in a ponytail, and he dressed like the Chinese. And the other missionaries and missionary organizations resented it. They thought, he's gone off the deep end. He's gone native. No. He was taking the gospel message, and out of respect for the culture that he was engaging with, he separated out the truth of the gospel and was able to adapt it without compromising that truth into the language of the people that he was trying to reach. Within 30 years, nobody was condemning Hudson Taylor because every ministry that was bearing fruit in China and for the next hundred years all had a connection to Hudson Taylor. Why? He was willing to go to a people and adapt the gospel to reach them. So what does that look like for us? Now, I could talk about programs we're doing and things the church is doing and all that, but what's more important than what the church is doing in general and what you write checks to support, what's more important is that this is inside of you. God would rather have you than your money. He would rather have you representing him on the street than just applauding other people that are doing it. And through the internet and Facebook and everything else, we can just spend the whole day vicariously living through everybody else that's doing it and somehow feel good about ourselves. But God has called all of us. He's put us in different places. He's put us around different people in different neighborhoods and different job settings, schools, campuses. Wherever we are, God has placed us there to be a light in that place. I think, just close with this, I think the best way we can respond is, as we talked about a few weeks ago, when Diane Lehman, who's co-pastor of the Urbana Vineyard Church with her husband, she was asked to write an article about what is the vineyard, and she saw it's easy. I can describe vineyard churches in one sentence. If you remember, we talked about this. This sentence was seven words. 
can I pray for you right now? She said, that's it. Because what we are doing in that moment, when we avail ourselves to God and to people, we bring this value, this mission of loving God and loving people, they are met in that moment. We are connecting God with people and people with God because we are becoming that conduit. When I pray for someone in that moment, I am making that connection between them and heaven that they can't make unless God just somehow reveals himself to them. Most likely, the way God wants to reveal himself and to touch them is through you. And yes, this involves some risk, huge risk. And this is something that I'm just trying to get better at. I think I got to the stage in life where I just went, eh, let the young people do it. You know, I'm just here to equip the saints. And God says, you're here to model what sainthood is. That's what you're here to do. Not just talk about it, but to live it. And it's a challenge. Because I can get so on mission. I can be so focused on what I'm doing for God that I can miss what God wants to do in the moment. I can pass people by because I'm going to do it. go do something for God. And I'm praying, God, change that in me. Oh, we talk about my time a lot, me and God. You know, because I feel like I have a right to my time. And God says, you mean my time. <laughs> uh, that's one of those rights I want you to yield to me. And as I give God my time, incredible stuff happens. Now I'm not frustrated if I'm stuck in traffic. Because it's not my time, it's God's. Well, if I'm late for a meeting, I blame it on God. No. <laughs> no, I own it when it's me. But I don't, I don't trip over myself, just, oh, I'm so sorry. I was, you know, sometimes I just show up and, or what I try to do is tell people if I'm going to be late, hey, I'm running five minutes late. And people are usually good with that. My point is, is we can live our life on our own terms, doing our thing, and believe the whole time that we're doing something for God. I believe what God wants is that moment-by-moment -moment connection with Him, where at any time He can speak to us, and we're always listening, and always ready, and ready to accept the grace to obey. I didn't say ready to obey. I said, ready to receive the grace to obey. God, would you help me? I know you want me to go pray for that person. I'm just not feeling it. Would you give me the grace to go do it anyway? And God does. That's what's amazing. Why? Because he loves that person. And he loves me. And he knows that divine encounter that I get to be there to make happen is something that will build my faith as well. So my challenge to you today is this week, would you pray and just ask God, God, would you show me opportunities where I can say to someone, because I sense you're, there might be a hundred people around, but God may identify one person. Go talk to that person. Ask them if there's anything you can pray with in their life. And then don't be weird, just be simple. Keep your eyes open. Whenever I pray for somebody in public, I always keep my eyes open. So I want to see what God's doing in their life, and I don't want it to be this thing that's weird and long. God, this is going on in their life. Would you minister to that? Would you just show yourself as a loving God? Would you pour your grace into them? Amen. Praying for people in public is a whole lot more effective than praying for people in church. God loves to show off. He loves to show his love to people, especially people he doesn't get to normally have interaction with, but he wants to. If he can use us in that way, that will cause us to change this community, to change the world.